God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself. At the end, forever, you and I will be in heaven or hell. What I'm doing here in this mini-series, How Catholics Read the Bible, is I'm taking the Second Vatican, II's, uh, Second Vatican Council's document, De Verbum, okay, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, and we're going through that chapter by chapter. There are six chapters in that document. That is the contemporary document that tells us how Catholics read the Bible. And there is a very definite method. So the six chapters, divine revelation itself. Number two, the transmission of divine revelation. We did those two last evening. Today, we're going to do sacred scripture, the divine, it's a divine inspiration and its interpretation. Then the Old Testament, then the New Testament, and then sacred scripture in the life of the church. All right, last evening we talked about divine revelation itself. It's very, very simple. God our Father, in his eternal and infinite love, so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but come to everlasting life. Divine revelation, quite simply, and please don't be so sophisticated and clever that simple things go right over your head. Many a scholar is guilty of that fault. They consider themselves so educated that they don't even get the simple thing. Remember this. God, by definition, is pure simplicity. That's a fact. But, as St. Thomas continues, not to us. We like to complicate a simple thing. Divine revelation, quite simply, is our Heavenly Father's revelation to us in the person of His only Son, His Word. I quoted to you from St. John of the Cross, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church also quotes from St. John of the Cross. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, His eternal word. He has no more to say. And so in the Word of God, which is not merely something, the Word of God is somebody, that's Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, in that Word our Heavenly Father has eternally spoken everything all at once. But we can't receive it all at once, our intellect is incapacitated to do that, so we have to try to go step by step in a rational process to try to comprehend this word. But the word of God is Jesus Christ. The Bible. The Bible. Every word in it. All of the words in it. What do they speak about? Jesus Christ. And, and you may say, yeah, but I, I can't see Jesus in this sentence from the Old Testament. Of course you can. not Your eyes aren't good enough. Plain English. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, I can't see that. Imagining there's something wrong with this or there's something wrong with the principles or with theology. Not, not a thing wrong with that. We can't see it immediately because our vision isn't good enough. Very, very simple. We have a finite mind. And what are we trying to do? What is the object of our consideration? God. God is the object of our consideration, and he is infinite. So it's perfectly logical. How's a finite mind going to totally grasp the infinite God? Can't be done. All right, but we do the best we can. One little step at a time. So divine revelation, that's how Catholics approach the Bible because that is how God intends it. God reveals himself to us in the person of his only word. Now that word, Jesus, is transmitted to us in two distinct ways. An oral transmission of the Word of God, that's called sacred tradition. Jesus taught orally. They called him rabbi, teacher. 
And he said, well, that you should call me teacher, for that I am. Jesus is the teacher. Now, that divine revelation, Jesus, is handed on to us, transmitted to us, in sacred tradition. Now, that's the preaching, the oral preaching of Jesus Christ. His teaching, the way he lived, how the apostles saw him, that whole body of doctrine concerning Jesus Christ. That is handed on, first of all, in an oral way, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Sacred tradition. The apostles handed on the teaching of Christ. Their successors, the bishops, hand on the teaching of the apostles. That's the apostolic kerygma or sacred tradition. Some of that was written down. Okay? You got that now? Some of that was written down. Not all of it. What was written down, that's the Bible. It was written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, divinely inspired. God is the author of sacred scripture. Every bit of it. Old Testament, New Testament, it is all inspired and it is useful for teaching, for formation in morals and so forth. All right. God is one. Only one God. We all know that. There's one God. We believe in God. One God. The Father Almighty. He's three divine persons. The one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The revelation, the revealing of that one God is Trinitarian. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching. Remember I said last night that wherever you have a word, whether it's orally transmitted or transmitted in writing, you've got to have an authentic and authoritative interpreter of that word, that word of God. It's absolutely essential. Now, the magisterium, that's the interpreter of the word of God. That's the Pope and the bishops united to him. What happens, now this is perfectly logical, what happens if you don't have that authority? Well, what happens is people begin to interpret it on their own. And you end up with as many interpretations of it as you do people reading it. And very often, those interpretations are opposed. And that can't be right. There's something wrong with that. You remember last night, I I pointed out a very important uh, thing when I closed the, uh, the second talk. I reminded you of that time when... Jesus addressed the apostles and he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And I pointed out to you the translation. The original Greek makes a distinction The Latin, translated from that Greek, is faithful to that translation. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you all. That he might sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you personally, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. You want to be included in the prayer for Peter, for that is where unity subsists. If you are not included in that prayer for Peter, what happens? Satan sifts us as wheat. And what was once one now becomes many. What happens when you sift wheat? Why, it's divided and divided and divided and divided. And that's why we have now over 50,000 Christian groups teaching various things. Some of them the same, some of them conflicting and contradictory. Doesn't fulfill the Lord's wish of one flock and one shepherd. So that's very important in this approach to divine revelation, in this approach to 
how Catholics read the Bible, we have to understand that sacred scripture has to be, number one, read as a totality, number two, read in the light of sacred tradition, and number three, read applying the analogy of the faith. I've just given you a preview now of this third lecture, which we're going to present to you. Sacred scripture, its inspiration and interpretation. Those divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in sacred scripture have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now that's paragraph 11 from De Verbo. The church, following the belief of the apostles, believes that the entire canon of sacred scripture is inspired. The Old and New Testaments in their entirety with all their parts, are sacred and canonical because all of it is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Every now and then you'll run into somebody, supposedly educated, who makes a very silly statement, oh, that's Old Testament teaching. As though the Old Testament were somehow obliterated by the New. Not true at all. The entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and all the parts thereof, all of it's sacred, all of it's inspired, all of it's useful. If we had eyes to see, and we were able to look at the Bible as it is, you would be able to see that in every little distinct part of it, all the rest of it is contained. God is the one you have to look at to understand that. Remember I pointed out to you last evening that wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the entire Trinity is made present. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, there you've got the Father and the Son. Wherever the Son is, there you have the Father and the Holy Spirit. Spirit that, that's the mystery of unity in the Trinity. Well, what has God revealed to us in his word? Himself. Himself. People sometimes are rather surprised or amazed that I can walk into a church or any place at any time and preach on anything without any preparation. You could open this Bible to any place, point your finger at random, and I, I, can, I can hold forth for an hour, two hours. <laughs> 12 hours. <laughs> Why is that? that? Even a lot of priests and preachers are kind of startled by that. Oh, gee, I have to prepare for hours. I've, I'm going to tell you a little secret. And it's not a secret, but you'd think it is because so many people don't know it. Any part of Scripture contains all of Scripture. Why? What's been revealed in the Word? God. And he's a strict unity and integrity. So I can open up this Bible, and it says, instead of stones, iron, I'll make you overseers, overseers of peace, and your taskmasters will become righteous. Well, this is something from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Now, I could start preaching on that. And if I kept going long enough, and you had the time and the energy to listen to it, I'd preach on the whole Bible before it was done. Why? Because contained in that is everything. All your taskmasters in Egypt, Israel, figure and type of the church, taken into bondage, living in a cruel slavery, a prefigurement of, of the church in every age, but Christ, the liberator, come to set the captives free, lifted up on a cross that he might all, draw all men to himself. The whole history of salvation, right there. What does every single word of the Bible talk about? Jesus Christ. Even the Old Testament? Yes. Even the Old Testament. All of it. And so when you, you, you open it up, you look at it, you might not be able to see that immediately. Granted. Granted. Maybe you will never be able to see that, but we know by faith that that's the way it is. You have to have a spiritual way of thinking. 
how Catholics read the Bible, there is a very definite method, methodology on how to do this. All right. All the books of the Bible teach solidly, faithfully, and without error the truth which God wanted to put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. Now, no, for the sake of our salvation. Now, if someone deduces that because John the Baptist did it, it would be a good thing to have grasshoppers for breakfast. <laughs> no, that's not what it would be. You say, oh, well, then there's an error. And no. For the sake of our salvation. All right? Teaches without error. The Bible teaches without error that truth which God wanted to put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. You have to understand that the point of all this, the point of all this, is the salvation of souls. The reason that God gave us this revelation of himself in the word is to save our souls. He wants us to be with him for all eternity. Now, I have to tell you that in a great many scholarly circles, they've forgotten that. Now, scholarship's a great thing. Don't get me wrong. I think highly of education, especially education in the faith. And we owe a great debt to theologians and scholars of every age, especially when they're faithful. We don't owe a debt to them when they're not faithful. We owe a boot in the pants to them. That's what we owe to them when they're not faithful because they undermine the word of God. And that has happened, sadly. In many cases, oh, I've, I've sat in the middle of meetings with them. You know, years ago when I first started, I remember a very liberal feminist religious sister saying to me, oh, you don't really understand. You don't understand the faith because you have no, no education. And so I went off and earned an additional four university degrees. <laughs> Summa cum laude. And then I went back, and my education was about four times what hers was, and she said, she d d dismissed it cavalierly. Oh, well, well, your education is just too conservative. <laughs> the truth does not admit of conservative and liberal left or right. It is what it is. You're in it or you're out of it. It's very simple. You're either in the light or you're in the darkness. Most of it is very black and white. The devil's favorite color is gray. Mark my words. He likes to sow confusion and doubt. Some of his favorite contemporary terms are nuances. Oh, you don't understand the nuances. What they've done is they've taken pure intelligibility and nuanced it into utter ambiguity. They've taken God, who is pure light, and twisted it and turned it, diminished it and distorted, such that that light has become darkness. They walk about blind, leading the blind, deceived and deceiving others. Watch out. One time a good bishop said to me, now I don't want you to say anything negative. And I said, why, Bishop, whatever would make you think I would do such a thing? <laughs> and he laughed. And I said, look, the only thing I can talk to you about is electricity, and I'm not an electrician. But I know this. In order to have power, you've got a positive as well as a negative pole. Leave out the negative and have only the positive. What do you have? No power. No power. The lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed if your light is darkness, how deep, how very deep will the darkness be? Now I understand they're concerned, don't say anything negative, but look, if a nation is sick with a disease, a contagion, and they go to the medical profession and say, look, you've got to, you've got to heal this, this disease, it's a threat to society. People are dying by the thousand, and they send some great physician in or a research scientist, and he calls an afflicted person in and he says, ah, let's see. 
Well, my, uh, you have nice shiny hair. And, and, and your feet are so sound and strong. The problem might, might be their arm it fell off. <laughs> and he very, very carefully and assiduously avoids anything to do with the arm, the diseased part. And yet he talks about all the good things. What good has he done? No good at all. Accentuate the positive. Be aware. Be advised of the negative. God speaks in sacred scripture through men in human fashion. The interpreter of sacred scripture, in order to see clearly what God wants to communicate to us, should carefully investigate what meaning the sacred writers really intended and what God wanted to manifest by means of their words. In other words, scholars, exegetes, have to arrive at what it is that the human author is trying to say. Now, God's the primary author of sacred scripture, but he has to he use human instruments. Now, he gave them a special charism, a gift of the Holy Spirit, such that they would write what God wanted them to write, and only that for the sake of our salvation. And there's no error in it. And we have to get, in studying, we have to get it to the bottom of, well, what, what did the author, what was he trying to say? What was he really trying to say? Now, in many cases, it's not so difficult. It means exactly what it says. We have to be careful, though, that we study what's called literary forms, literary genres. Now, you realize not every book of the Bible is the same kind of literature. Some of them are historical books. Right? They record a certain history of things that, that took place. Some of them are prophetic in nature. Uh, some of them are poetic, like the Psalms. All of them teach, all of them are instructive, all of them are good, but they, they convey this word, this one word of God, in different ways. You know, you can convey meaning to somebody in different ways. You could write them a poem to convey your love. Uh, you could write a narrative. Uh, which would seek to chronicle accurately something that happened in history. Um, let me put it to you this way. Let's say you wanted to get a message to your relatives or friends in Florida. Now, you could um, send a message by Western Union. You could send a message to the mail, U.S. Postal Service. You could send a message to UPS, Federal Express, whatever. You could give it to a friend of yours who's a pilot. He flies his plane down there and hands it to them. You would call him up on the telephone. Same message, different ways of transmitting that message. Now, the books of the Bible transmit the same message, the same word. It's the one word of God. But there are different ways of accomplishing the mission. Right? You can transmit that message different ways. Sometimes it's in a poetic way. Poetry speaks the heart. Sometimes it's in uh, a prophetic way, a very spiritual, mystical way. Sometimes it's merely the recounting of history. And sometimes there's a little bit of all of the above, perhaps. We have to be aware that there is such a thing as a literary form, that, that things are written in a specific form. That, that's one of the things exegetes and scholars do, and, and they should do. It's very important. We want to arrive at the literal meaning of what the author was trying to convey, or I should say what God is trying to convey through the human author. For the correct understanding of what the sacred author wants to assert, due attention must be paid to the customary and characteristic styles of feeling, speaking, and narrating which prevailed at the time of the sacred writer and the patterns that men normally employed at that period in their everyday dealings with one another. Let me give you an example. Um, now, I preach all over the place, and whenever I preach, it's always uh, recorded, you know, on audio cassettes. And sometimes, like in this series, it's being videotaped. Uh, we now have CDs, so we, we have all those forms. Let's say 
they decided to take some of my material and put it in a time capsule, okay, and bury it somewhere or shoot it to Mars. Some people think I came from there, <laughs> and so they might as well send my stuff back there. But in a thousand years from now, somebody digs up the time capsule or finds it on Mars, or, and they open it up, and, they, and I'm beginning one of my sermons. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm so edified to see so many of you here, a thousand or more of you here today. And then I go on and on and on. They, they, later they, they say, wow, he had over a thousand brothers and sisters. I'd like to know his daddy. <laughs> he must have been something. And so they say, Mary had many children. Jesus had other brothers and sisters, hence Mary couldn't have been a virgin before, during, and after the birth of her only son. And they purport to deduce it from sacred scripture, violating the principles for the interpretation of sacred scripture. Reading as a, as a totality, reading it in the light of sacred tradition, reading it applying the analogy of the faith. You can never deduce that if you followed the very principles that guide biblical scholarship in the Catholic Church. So uh, this is important. That's why we have to apply these, these principles. The interpreter has to say, well, well what were the, the um, modes of speech in those days? How, how did they talk to each other? What is it? Now, look, back then, it wasn't much different than now in that sense. His brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, my brethren. It doesn't necessarily mean your brother blood, you know, your mother's biological child. Not necessarily. Not at all. And you have to take that in consideration in trying to read the word of God. All right. No. Now, no. What I've been talking about here is internal, what's called internal criticism. Higher criticism, it's been termed. That is where you take a text of scriptures, and exegetes should do this, have to do this, and they subject it to what's called an internal criticism. In other words, they, read, they go back to the original languages, and they've studied those languages, and they read it, and they, and they say, okay, they arrive at the meaning. In other words, what did the author try to convey? What was that human author of that scripture, what was he trying to say? You've got to be careful, though, with internal criticism. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, there was once a great statesman in this country named Conrad Adenauer. Conrad Adenauer once said, God has placed obvious limitations on our intelligence, but none whatever on our stupidity. <laughs> Now, you get my point. Watch it. We've got to watch out. We have to be careful. We want to study the text. We want to be able to use, interpret it, those ancient languages in which the scriptures were written in the first place. We want to study those ancient cultures. We want to know all these things. But internal criticism is limited, very limited. I'm going to read to you from a document on biblical scholarship written over a hundred years ago. And it is still very relevant today by Pope Leo XIII. His document, Providentissimus Deus. There has arisen to the great detriment of religion an inept method dignified by the name of higher criticism. Wow. I, a lot of contemporary scholars today would absolutely cringe that a pope said that. I'm, I like it so much, I'm going to read it again. <laughs> there has arisen to the great detriment of religion an inept method 
dignified by the name of higher criticism, which pretends to judge the origin, integrity, and authority of each book of the Bible from internal indications alone. Now, internal indications are of value. It's one thing that we should use. But when you use those internal indications alone, you're asking for big trouble. It is clear, on the other hand, that in historical questions such as the origin and the handing down of writings, the witness of history is of primary importance. And that historical evidence is seldom of great value except as confirmation. To look upon it in any other light will be, open, will be to open the door to many evil consequences. The Pope is speaking prophetically here. It will make the enemies of religion much more bold and confident in attacking and mangling the sacred books. And this vaunted higher criticism will resolve itself into the reflection of the bias and prejudice of the critics. It will not throw on the scriptures the light which is sought or prove of any advantage to doctrine. It will only give rise to disagreement and dissension, those sure notes of error which the critics in question so plentifully exhibit in their own persons. And seeing that most of them are tainted with false philosophy and rationalism, it must lead to the elimination from the sacred writings of all prophecy, of all miracles, and of everything that is outside the natural order. That is exactly what happened in the ensuing 100 years. The elimination of prophecy, the elimination of the miracles of Christ, oh, God help us, it's the homiletic explanations of the loaves and fishes that some of us have heard. Well, the real miracle was that they shared it with each other. Happy horse manure. No. Jesus, in fact, multiplied the loaves and fishes. It is, in fact, a miracle. And the church asserts that and defends that. But in using, or I should say abusing, these methods of internal criticism, which have a place, which have a place, but it has to be balanced with the other things, the other methods that we use, by abusing it, they seek to throw out the miracles of Christ. They seek to throw out the spiritual meaning of the scriptures. They reduce the scriptures to a dead letter and a bland academic exercise with the power to save no one's soul. And that is not scholarship. That is not education. Let me give you a good, simple working definition of education, especially Catholic education. Education leads us more deeply into the truth. That truth, once again, is not something but somebody. If you are an educated person, you have gone further on a journey than most people. You have gone on a journey of truth. You have entered more deeply into the mystery of truth. Where does that journey end, ultimately? God himself. That journey of truth ends in heaven. That's the whole point of education, where education leads you astray, where education sidetracks you, confuses you. That's something other than authentic education. Now, all education, properly so-called, is excellent. Biology is excellent. Chemistry, physics, mathematics, all of it is excellent when it's authentic. If you continue on your journey, and don't stop short, all education leads to God. It has to. Why? Because God is the author of all that is. And we reason from effects back to the first cause. And so authentic education leads you on an exciting, beautiful, mystical journey 
to God himself, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. All right. And so St. Leo warns us about overemphasis on internal criticism. And I'll tell you something, an awful lot of biblical scholarship for many years overemphasized that. In the last many years, I told you about the case last night of how the professor walked in the classroom one time, announced to us how he was going to tell us what the manna in the desert was, and then he, without blinking an eye, announced that the manna in the desert is ant dung from a species of carpenter ant that inhabited the Judean desert, and he called that scholarship. Now that's ant dung. Paragraph 112 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that since the Holy Scriptures must be read and interpreted in the same spirit in which it was written, no less serious attention must be given. Now, I'm going to give you here the three principles for the reading and interpretation of sacred scripture. Now, I'm coming now at this point, we're getting into the the sum and substance of this mini-series on how Catholics read the Bible. Yes, we have to uh, arrive at the intention of the human authors. We've got to do that. We've got to get come to the literal sense of the Scriptures. Okay. But since the Scriptures have God, the Holy Spirit, as their primary author, you've got to read the Scriptures with the same Spirit who wrote them in the first place. Otherwise, you're going to remain an amateur and an outsider. There are three principles in interpreting and reading sacred scripture as the Catholic Church does it. Please know these principles. Number one, we must be attentive or, uh, to the content and unity of the whole of scripture. In other words, don't, don't take it out of context. You know, the, the danger is we take a little passage of Scripture, we put it under a magnifying glass. Now, we have to do some of that in translation, in arriving at the literal sense. But the danger is if, if you don't do that in a balanced way, you do it with myopically, with blinders on, and you arrive at all kinds of preposterous conclusions. Jesus didn't know he was God. Jesus didn't intend to found a church. Mary had lots of children. On and on and on. They ignore the basic principles. You know, I would have, my grandfather was a carpenter. And every now and then, you know, he'd have an apprentice. And the apprentice learned his trade from the master carpenter. I remember, I'll never forget it, one time after working with this apprentice for a long time, he said, son, either learn your trade or get another one. And we'd have to say that to some of these scholars. Either learn the principles of your trade or get another one. And here are the three principles for reading and interpreting sacred scripture as the Catholic Church does it. Number one, you've got to read it as a totality. Don't take it out of context. And what does that mean? I gave the example last night. That minister down in Florida was preaching, using the Bible to justify homicide of abortion doctors. You can't do it. Of saying, well, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You hurt me and I'll hurt you. It says so right in the Bible. You didn't read the whole thing. You don't know what the Bible, you took that out of context. You can't do that. You must read the sacred scriptures in, in their entirety. All right, that's number one. Number two, you have to read the scripture within the living tradition of the whole church. Here's where sacred tradition comes into play. You've got to read the sacred scriptures in the light of sacred tradition. What if you don't even acknowledge the existence of sacred tradition? What if you don't believe in that? Well, then you can't exercise that second principle. You're not going to read the scriptures in the light of sacred tradition. And what's going to happen? You're not going to achieve the desired end. You're not going to understand it. 
you're going to go afield. You're going to deceive others because you yourself are deceived. Now that may have an impact on your family. If you're a priest, it could have impact on your whole parish. If you're a bishop, it could have impact on your whole diocese. How are we going to read it in the light of tradition if we don't even know what tradition is? You know, how many people made a study of what the fathers, doctors, and saints of the church have had to say about it? One of the first things I did in the beginning of my education in our faith is to read prayerfully and systematically over 500 lives of the saints. And I began to study the writings of the fathers and doctors of the church. I've read thousands and thousands of books, but I've read them in a kind of different way. I've always gone before God and say, Lord, you know who I am, and you know what I am. I am an ignorant man, an arrogant one, prone to error. I can't do this, but you can. I've gone to our mother, the mother of the eternal and incarnate word, Mary. And I've asked her for her help, and she has given it to me. And that is the way to approach this, prayerfully and most of all, humbly. Let me tell you something. Don't you imagine for a moment you're smarter than your enemy, the devil. None of us are. Angelic intelligence. Last weekend I was in Michigan giving a conference on spiritual warfare, immortal combat, I entitled it. This, this tremendous combat we have. St. Paul talked about it. I didn't make it up. Uh, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, sixth chapter, about spiritual warfare. Uh, we've got spiritual enemies. You approach the reading of the Word of God any way other than humbly, he will, the devil will twist your mind up. You won't know which way, so. You'll begin to think that you are educated. In fact, you are anything but. There are a great many people who go about deceived and deceiving others. Watch out. All right. Three principles. Number one, you've got to read the scripture as a totality. Number two, you've got to read it in the light of sacred tradition. And number three, you have to read it applying what's called the analogy of the faith. That harmony which exists between all elements of the faith. Okay. Now, the first is self-explanatory, I think, more or less. Know the whole Bible. In other words, know your faith. Now, I'm going to show you, I've got all my little books here today. Last night I came relatively unarmed. <laughs> Bible, Catechism of the Catholic Church. Read these two books prayerfully and regularly, and you will be given light beyond your wildest dreams. These two books, the Bible and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this contains revelation, all of it. Scripture, tradition, magisterial teaching. Read this in the light of this. Good to have a weapon in both hands. And they are indeed formidable, formidable weapons in this war between light and darkness. All right. Let me give you uh, an, uh, an explanation, a definition of the analogy of the faith. Because probably by now you understand the first, the first two. Read scripture as a totality. Don't take it out of context. Read it in the light of sacred tradition. We've talked about sacred tradition. That's the oral teaching of Jesus Christ given to the apostles and handed on to their successors, the bishops, and apostolic succession. Number three, read the scriptures applying the analogy of the faith. Let me tell you what, once again, Pope Leo XIII says about the analogy of the faith. In other passages, meaning those which do not have a built-in interpretation from the writers themselves, or an interpretation of the magisterium of the church already given, the analogy of faith should be followed, and Catholic doctrine, as authoritatively proposed by the church, should be held as the supreme law 
foreseeing that the same God is the author both of the sacred books and the doctrine committed to the church, it is clearly impossible that any teaching can by legitimate means be extracted from the former, which shall in any respect be at variance with the latter. Hence, it follows that all interpretation is foolish and false, which either makes the sacred writers disagree one with another or is opposed to the doctrine of the faith. Any interpretation drawn out of sacred scripture which is not in accord with the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith is false. When they say Mary had other children, Mary was not a virgin, when they claim to use scripture to arrive at those conclusions, you know that it's false. Because any conclusion from scripture must be in accord with the doctrine of the faith. Other, it's, it's not possible. For the Bible, let me put it this way. It is not possible for anything here to oppose anything here. It's flat impossible. And if someone comes along, if an angel should come down from heaven preaching or teaching something that claims an opposition between scripture and the doctrine of the faith, let him go to hell where he came from. Kind of paraphrasing St. Paul, right? If an angel should come down from heaven and preach to you a, doc, a, a gospel other than what we gave to you in the beginning, let him be damned. That's what St. Paul said. They'd send St. Paul off to sensitivity training. <laughs> Jesus too. Sorry, but that, that's the way it is. All right. So you've got those three principles. When you read the Bible, how Catholics read the Bible? Read it as a totality. Read it in the light of the sacred tradition of the whole church. And read it applying the analogy of the faith. Now, you will, no one in here, I hope, will be mystified from this point on, and you should be able to give a, an explanation to others if they say, sacred tradition? Well, what's that? Uh, analogy of the faith? I never heard of that. You can enlighten them. Now, I exhort you once again to read the document. Read the document. Take Dave Erbum. You can get it in any Catholic bookstore from the documents of Vatican II, the book, or the Daughters of St. Paul have published a lot of these things in individual pamphlets like this. Read it. Read De Verbum. That's the definitive document on how Catholics read the Bible. Read the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All right? Read these uh, encyclicals on biblical studies, one by Pope Leo XIII. Providentissimus Deus, and one by Pope Pius XII, Divino Aflante Spiritu. Don't worry about those words. Just ask them about the encyclicals on biblical studies. There aren't many of them. But mainly read De Verbum and read the Catechism. And most of all, read the Bible. Read the Bible. That's what the whole thing is about. But what we're trying to come to is the method, the way that we do it. Now, according to an ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two essential senses of scripture, the literal and the spiritual. The literal is what we start with. Everything else begins with the literal. What was the author trying to say? We arrive at the literal sense. Then we have the, the spiritual sense. The literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of scripture and discovered by exegesis, following the rules of sound interpretation. All other senses of sacred scripture are derived and based on the literal sense. Now then we have the spiritual sense, and that's broken down into three subcategories. All of this, by the way, is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And so you can, after, if you say, I, I forgot everything Father said, Take it, look in, the, look in the index in the back. You know, you want to look up 
whatever it is. Just look, in, it's a great index. Look it up and just read it. And you should do that anyway. E even if you think you didn't forget, you can always go more deeply into it. So, so do that. Now, the three spirit set, um, subcategories of spiritual sin. Okay. Now, thanks to the unity of God's plan, not only the texts of Scripture, but also the realities and events about which it speaks can be signs. Very important. Can be signs. The allegorical sense we can acquire a more profound understanding of events in the Bible by recognizing their significance in Christ. For instance, the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, please, uh, once again, some of the absurd explanations that have come about. You know, um, I, I, oh, I don't even want to be, I, where could I begin with them? Oh, well, that was just a natural phenomenon. The wind will change direction. <laughs> right. Okay, the, the parting of the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea, that's a sign and type of Christ's victory over evil. The, uh, remember when the uh, Israelite people had complained against God and God sent seraph serpents, bit them, many of them died, and God told Moses, to fashion a bronze serpent and raise it up on the pole, and if they looked on it, they'd be healed of the serpent's bite and they'd live. That's a biblical type of Christ lifted up on the cross. He became sin for us. He never sinned himself, but he suffered and died for our sins. Looking upon the cross, believing, we're healed of the serpent's bite. Sin. Okay, the moral sense... That subcategory of spiritual sin, the moral sense. The events reported in Scripture ought to lead us to act justly. As St. Paul says, these Scriptures were written for our instruction. So there's a moral sense to Scripture. It teaches us how to live. Now, I don't know how people get around some of the plain stuff found in the Bible. And they try to rationalize it and justify it and explain it away. And you just flat can't do it. There are certain things that are right and there are certain things that are wrong. There are things that are good and there are things that are evil, things that are true and things that are false. Don't try to explain it away. There is moral instruction. I'll never forget a woman one time said to me, Oh, God doesn't care about what we do. All we have to do is love each other. And she was trying to make a point. She was loving a lot of people at the time. <laughs> and fancied herself a Christian. You know. <laughs> All right. Third, the anagogical sense, meaning that's from a Greek word, anagoge, or leading to. We can view realities and events in terms of their eternal significance, leading us to our true destiny. And so we have the literal sense, that's what the author, the human author, was trying to convey, in fact. Then we have the spiritual sense, broken down into three. The allegorical sense, meaning we see all things in the light of Christ, spiritual significance. Secondly, a moral sense, that the scriptures lead us to act rightly. In other words, the fundamental moral law, do good, avoid evil. That's what the voice of conscience Tell us in third, the anagogical sense. And that means that sense of scripture which helps us move towards our ultimate end. And our ultimate end is heaven. To be happy with God for all eternity. That's how Catholics read the Bible. It's that simple. Don't complicate a simple thing. Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right.
quick recap. We finished three of the six lectures. We're halfway through. Divine revelation, the revelation of God our Father to us in the person of his only word, his only son, Jesus. So the Bible is about the word of God. And the word of God is not merely something. The word of God is somebody, Jesus the Lord. That word of God is transmitted to us in essentially three interdependent, interconnected, compenetrated ways. The word of God is transmitted to us in sacred scripture, written word, sacred tradition, the orally transmitted way or mode, that is the apostolic kerygma, remembering that Jesus was a preacher. He taught orally. The apostles primarily taught orally. That was handed on orally, sacred tradition. And then the magisterium of the church, the teaching office of the church. That is the authentic and authoritative interpreter of the word of God, whether written or spoken. So, it's a Trinitarian thing. God's revelation to us of himself in the person of his word, tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Please understand that. Uh, th this, this says Holy Bible on it, and indeed it is. This is the Holy Bible. But you've got to remember that this is not merely a book of words. This is the word. The word. This could not be the Bible without sacred tradition and magisterial teaching. After all, it didn't drop out of the sky. The canon of Scripture was arrived at by the magisterium of the church, considering the sacred tradition handed on to us. So the Bible didn't just drop out of the sky. The church determined, the magisterium of the church determined what would go in the Bible. So this can't even be the Bible without sacred tradition and magisterial teaching. Could the Trinity indeed be the Trinity, or I should say, could God be God if he wasn't Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No. If your concept of God is Holy Spirit alone, your concept of God is wrong. If your concept of God is Father alone, your concept of God is wrong. If your concept of God is, yes, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's right. And your concept of revelation, to be right, scripture, tradition, magisterial teaching. It's a Trinitarian thing. All right. I'm going to continue. Uh, I said I had all my weapons here. Could, could you believe it? I've added to my arsenal the Sacramento Bee. Well, that right on the front of the, uh, the this morning's scene section of the Sacrament OB, Religion and Ethics, it says, say a little prayer. See that? The Sacrament OB is very good. They're telling us to pray. Not bad. Actually, I've seen some good things in the Sacrament OB. Now, they're talking about a book, a little book that's come out, and it's quite a phenomenon, for better or for worse, whatever you think about it, but I, I'm going to use it to make a point. Now, this fourth lecture in our series, How Catholics Read the Bible, is on the Old Testament. That's the fourth chapter of the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation from the Second Vatican Council. The Old Testament. All right. They have a major feature article on the front page under Religion and Ethics on the Prayer of Jabez. It's a book, a little book that was written by a minister. And how did this slim little book, based on an obscure biblical plea, become one of the hottest sellers in years? Sold over 7 million copies. And the Protestant minister who wrote it, little did he know that, that this would become a major bestseller. And the publisher, they had no clue that this was going to happen. Now the point that I'm going to make with this, it, it's today's news, so I might as well use it because it is pertinent. Let me read to you this prayer of Jabez. It's from 1 Chronicles 
And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. That little obscure passage from First Chronicles, a little book gets written and sells over seven million copies almost overnight. You could say, are you surprised, Father? And I could say, no way I'm surprised. Why would I be surprised? The word of God is filled with power. And even one sentence of it, if it's properly presented and properly understood, it contains all the power of the word of God. Remember before I said any part of it contains the whole thing? Well, the word of God is pure power. God, by definition, is pure act, absolute dynamism. And so am I surprised that this little book is of interest and people are buying it by the millions? I'm not surprised in the least. Now, some people have a concern that, well, uh, maybe people will, will approach reading a scripture improperly or they'll misinterpret it. Uh, and you could say, well, what's your response to it, positive or negative? You think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Look, I think it's a good thing. I think it is a good thing whenever people read the Scripture. Uh, admittedly, a lot of people don't necessarily read them with the fullness of uh, truth or understanding, but you've got to start somewhere. You know, it reminds me of a, a few weeks ago, well, more than a few, a few months ago, I was preaching during Lent. And I went and I arrived, as I always do, and the pastor said to me, uh, I want you to preach on hell. And I, I said, you want me to preach on hell? And usually they're telling me, don't preach on hell. <laughs> but he said, I want you to preach on hell. And I said, what, why on earth is that? I'd rather preach on heaven myself. Uh, but, you know, hell's part of the doctrine of the faith. And he said, well, I, my people don't believe it anymore, some of them. You know, they read some bad stuff. And I think they, you know, they imagine that it doesn't exist or, or something. So I said, well, okay, I try to do the pastors, the boss, and I go there as a servant wherever I go, and I try to help the pastor, and I'll do, you know, whatever he wants me to do if I can. So I, I had the dilemma. So that it was Friday night, and the next day, you know, I had to, no, actually that night I had to begin that very night, and so I quickly thought, what the heck am I going to do, you know? These people don't really know me. I've never been to that parish before, and I don't want to come out guns blazing on hell. <laughs> so I just prayed to the Holy Spirit, and I went up, and uh, I began, well, my dear brothers and sisters, this evening we shall begin with hell in order that we don't end there. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> anyway, this little book, from, on, based on that from the Old Testament, uh, carries a lot of power. Now, this chapter, this lecture now on the Old Testament, the Old Testament is the Word of God. Uh, the Old Testament wasn't done away with when the New Testament came into play. Uh, a lot of people are mistaken. They think that the Old Testament has to do with the commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments, it, it, certainly they're in there. And uh, by the way, Vatican II didn't change them to the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> they're still the Ten Commandments. And they abide always and everywhere, and no one has the power to dispense from them. But a lot of times people say, oh, well, the Old Testament is about a vengeful, judging God, a harsh God. The New Testament is about mercy and love. Wrong. Bad. Bad theology, bad conclusion. The Word of God is the Word of God, and it's one word, and there's no contradiction in it. And those who try to uh, set up a polemic between the Old Testament and the New, they don't understand how it works. The Word of God is one, the Bible is one. The Old Testament foreshadows, points toward the New Testament, and the New Testament fulfills what is in the Old Testament. I have seen where uh, 
And once again, reiterating what I said before, I have the greatest respect, and I do, for all religions. But, you know, that being the case, I, I'm one of the maladies I don't suffer from is the curse of political correctness. <laughs> and indeed, it is a curse. Mark my words, it is one of the worst afflictions that besets humanity in our days. The absolute curse of political correctness. Happily, I don't give a you-know-what, who likes it and who doesn't. A rabbi, and I respect the Jewish people enormously. I have a reverence for them. Now, I do not only respect the chosen people. They are the chosen people, you know. That didn't change. God named them the chosen people. They still are. I'm not saying that the Jewish religion is the right one, but I have enormous respect, reverence even. Believe me. You know, you ever see that bumper sticker, my boss a Jewish carpenter? <laughs> I have the greatest reverence for the Jewish people. I really do. And uh, rabbis, of course, have a very noble calling, and I respect them very much. A rabbi cannot teach Old Testament in a seminary or Catholic university, but they've been doing it. We've been hiring them for some time. Why can a rabbi not teach Old Testament? And he may be absolutely fluent in Hebrew. He may know the history of it very, very well. He may have it memorized word for word. Why can't a rabbi teach Old Testament for the same reason that a Protestant biblical scholar can't teach scripture in a Catholic seminary or university, but they're doing it here and there. Why? Because they don't understand it the way we do. Very simply. In order to understand the Old Testament, you have to understand the New Testament. In order to truly understand the New Testament, you have to understand the Old Testament. If you don't believe in sacred tradition, how are you going to interpret the scriptures? If you don't even have the analogy of the faith and the doctrine of the faith, how are you going to understand what the scriptures are saying? You can't. And so I don't care how fluent you are in Hebrew or Greek. If you don't believe what we believe, you can't teach in our universities. It is very, very simple. To ignore that is to court disaster. And we have had more than our share of academic disaster in recent years. Once again, why can a rabbi not be allowed to teach Old Testament in a Catholic institution? because he doesn't believe in the New Testament. Because that's not part of his belief system. And I'm not criticizing him for that. God bless him for being faithful to his faith. I'm not saying anything against him. I respect him. You think he, let me tell you one thing you'll never find. You'll never find a Catholic priest teaching in a Jewish biblical institute. <laughs> you know why? Because the Jews are a lot smarter than we are, that's why. No, I mean it. By the same token, if something happened in the United States of America that was blasphemous to the Jewish faith, oh, God help you. They, oh, the power, the power of the Jewish people. And, and I'm saying that as a, as a good thing. God bless them for sticking up for what they believe. But any number of blasphemous religious exhibit or art exhibits, so-called, that, that blaspheme Catholic faith, they get away with it. Why? We're not as zealous as Jews or Muslims in many cases. Shame on us. That's all. We get what we deserve. All right. The Old Testament, it's inspired. Every bit of it. God is the author of the Old Covenant. 
the Old Testament is an indispensable part of sacred scripture. Its books are divinely inspired, and they retain permanent value. For the Old Covenant has never been revoked. Okay, that's paragraph 121 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Old Covenant was not revoked by the New Covenant. It was fulfilled by the New Covenant, but there's one word of God and it has permanent value. The Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Do the Ten Commandments retain permanent value for us? Of course. Of course. I am amazed at any number of people who think that, oh, well, Ten Commandments aren't really important anymore. We have a religion now of love. Well, what makes you think that love and truth are opposed? Love and truth are names for God, and there's only one of them. God is love, God is truth, the one God. And so if you love God above all things, if you love your neighbor as yourself out of love for God, then abide in the truth. That's what Jesus told us to do, and that's what we have to do. So much wisdom is in the Old Testament. What tremendous, the Psalms. You ever read the Psalms? The, you know, we read the Psalms, we pray the Psalms, I should say, every day as the formal part of the church's liturgy. Priests and religious, and many lay people too, pray the liturgy of the hours. You know, we sanctify time. You have office of readings, you have morning prayer, daytime prayer, you have evening prayer, night prayer. We sanctify time. Uh, the heart of the liturgy of the hours is the Psalms. Beautiful, beautiful poetic text, praising God, expressing a tremendous wisdom in so doing. Um, the, uh, the wisdom books, you know, the book of Proverbs, for instance. Wow, uh, such a depth and breadth of wisdom. If you haven't read the Old Testament. Oh, please, do it. Book of Genesis. Now, the Holy Father, John Paul II, <clears throat> spent a lot of time giving a catechesis on the book of Genesis. Um, it, uh, Genesis 1 and 2 on creation. You know, you really, <clears throat> you can't understand anything that comes later if you don't start at the beginning, Genesis. If you don't understand, God created everything out of nothing. That's what creation is. Only God can do it. That's good. Very good. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3. Something goes wrong. What happens? Our first parents, deceived by the devil, the serpent, bit into the big lie. You can be like gods. You can be like gods. How can I do that? If only you will disobey God. Did God really tell you not to partake of the trees in the garden, the Old Testament says. Well, no, Eve said, God said, we may partake of all the trees in the garden. Human freedom is very broad. However, God said, we may not partake of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest we die. Human freedom has limits. And those limits are laid down by God. Oh, surely you do not believe God. He doesn't want you to be like him. For God knows that if you partake of that forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you yourselves will become gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, disobey God and you'll become God. The fundamental, the original sin, and then pride. Pride is the original sin. Ah, I can be like God, knowing good and evil subjectively and arbitrarily. In other words, I'll make it up as I go along. If I think it's good for me, I'll do it. If I think a promiscuous lifestyle is okay, who's going to stop me? If I want to choose, don't I have a right to choose? I'm going to do it. I'm going to play God. I'm going to decide subjectively and arbitrarily what's good and evil for me. 
That's arrogance. What happened? Disobedience follows. What follows that? Death, as God promised. Death entered Eden. Pride, disobedience, death. That's fundamental to the understanding of the reality we deal with. That's the Old Testament. That instructs us. And on it goes, the prophets. You know what a prophet is? We have the prophetic books in the Old Testament. <clears throat> you know what a prophet really is? Most people think that a, a prophet is somebody who foretells the future. You know, there's, there's that element. But that's not really what the essence of prophecy is. The prophets were people who were close to God. They were people of prayer. Uh, in the Old Testament, the prophets, like Elijah, Jeremiah, uh, for the most part, they were anchorites, contemplatives, like John the Baptist, that bridge between the Old Testament and the New. He was a hermit. He lived in the desert. Why? to be close to God. You, there are two things, spiritually speaking, mystically speaking, two things, two realities you find in the desert. God and the devil. What happened when Jesus went into the desert? Who did he encounter in the desert? Satan, right? That's right. And that's what the fathers, desert fathers, the great hermits, anchorites, and the, and the prophets, they encountered God in silence. They also encountered adversity, temptation, and suffering. And they were purified through those battles in the desert. The, the, the prophets were more people who dwelled day in and day out in the light of God. They abided in silence of prayer. And God spoke to them. And then, from out of the silence of the desert, they spoke to the people. They knew God. They knew God's mind. A prophet is someone who knows the heart and mind of God and then conveys that to the people. Very often, the prophets were countercultural. The prophetic books teach us something. <clears throat> You understand that Jesus Christ is the consummation of all the prophets and all prophecy. All the prophets pointed to Jesus, the Messiah. All the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, the Messiah. Remember who Jesus met up on the Mount of the Transfiguration? You know, up there, it was Elijah, right? Moses. The prophets knew God. Now, they would often tell the people, even the chosen people, God's not pleased with you. You remember what John the Baptist did? He's a good example. He's my patron saint. He didn't like what King Herod would. You know what King Herod did, right? <clears throat> Herod married his brother's wife committed adultery, and John let him know. It's not right for you to be living with your brother's wife. And you know what happened. John lost his head as the result of that. That's what happened to most of the prophets. What happened to Jesus? The consummation of all prophecy. Why, why did he come? I have come to bear witness to the truth. He proclaimed to Pilate. When he stood before Pilate, he said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. And Pontius Pilate, that prototype of every spineless politician, looked eternal truth right in the eye and said, Truth? What does that mean? As if to say, ah, oh, truth is relative. It's whatever you want it to be. That is not why the prophets died. That is not why Jesus died and rose on the third day. Bear witness to the truth. The Old Testament is filled with the truth, who is God. Christians venerate the Old Testament. Now I've got to ask you a question. Do you in fact venerate the Old Testament? Do you read it? 
Now, this little course, How Catholics Read the Bible, admittedly is too short, too synthesized, too condensed. But, you, you know, you've got to start somewhere. <clears throat> you know, like I said before, we started with hell so we wouldn't end there. Well, it's good to start with a short course, a basic, and then go on. But the whole point of it isn't to <clears throat> fancy yourself a scholar. The whole point of it is to be equipped so that you can read your Bible in a simple, prayerful way every day. And don't get all confused or taken up with, with what I'm talking about here. Make it part of your, your daily reading of Scripture, but it's not rocket science. It's not complicated. It's very simple. And the main point is, please read the sacred Scripture. Please. Make that part of your life. <clears throat> like I said before, it's like breathing. You don't want to stop breathing. You don't want to stop taking in the breath of God. Do you know where the term Holy Spirit comes from? You know, that third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It come, that, that's from a Hebrew word. Ruach HaKodesh. Breath of God. Holy Spirit. Breath of God. That's an interesting phrase. Breath of God. No breath, no life. Stop breathing, die. The breath of God. It is the Holy Spirit who is the author of sacred scripture. And not only the author, he's contained in the word of God. Remember the word of God is Jesus. And wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two must be. In virtue of the inviolable mystery of unity. And so Breathe in the life-giving word of God. And you'll have life. You'll live forever. And that's what this is about. All right. A note on biblical types. Now, this is a technical term. Don't be confused by it. It's easy. I'm going to give you uh, the definition Father John Harden, a great, great, teacher of the faith of our times. He passed away last year. Father Hardin in his modern Catholic dictionary defines biblical types as follows. A biblical person, thing, or action, or event that foreshadows new truths, new actions, or new events. In the Old Testament, Melchizedek and Jonah, I might add Moses and David and all the other heroes, are types, T-Y-P-E, type, of Christ. A likeness must exist between the type and the archetype, but the latter is always greater. Both are independent of each other. For instance, God calls for the return of Israel from bondage to Pharaoh. That typifies the return of Jesus from the flight to Egypt or the return of the sinner from his exile in sin. The scriptures are filled with this spiritual significance. The battle that is prefigured in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. You remember when uh, God addresses the serpent and he exiles him and he said, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours, that's called the Proto-Evangelium. That is a, a prefigurement, a looking into the future of what would happen. From that moment of the fall in the garden, enmity between the devil and the Blessed Mother or the church, it's a figure, and the spawn of the devil and the, the, and it's the children of God, the children of the church, the children of the Blessed Mother. The war was on. And it is a violent conflict. Now, like I said last night, I'm getting too old for silliness. Too old to waste my time on nonsensical arguments. I don't argue at all anymore with anybody. Every now and then I'll go around someplace and someone will fancy themselves a scholar. They read a book or two. And they'll want to challenge me on something, 
and they'll, you know, think that if I'm a um, responsible person, I should engage them in debate. I just have the police remove them. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I do. It's happened twice only in 10 years. But, uh, you know, you say, oh, that's a terrible attitude, Father. Nope. That's, that's my attitude, and you know what? That's exactly what the apostles normally would have done if they had this chance. You know what St. John once said? He, he was going into one of the baths, public baths in Ephesus with some of the disciples, and they took baths in those days too, I guess, huh? And, and uh, it, it, a heretic was there, one of the notorious heretics or attackers of the faith, and they got word to St. John, oh, so-and-so the heretic is over there on the other side of the building. And St. John leaped up and he raced out of the building yelling, get out, get out, the heretic so-and-so is in here, and the roof could fall in at any moment. <laughs> there is a place, and, it, and it's, a, it's good, and there's a productive place for debate. It's not a bad thing. I don't have time. I teach from a position of authority, all right? I, I'm part of the hierarchy. The bit, I didn't send myself. My superiors sent me. God gave them the grace, the inspiration to get me ordained and to send me. To do, do you know what the word apostle means? It comes from a Greek verb, apostolon, to be sent. An apostle is one who is sent. We are in the line of the apostles, the bishops, first and foremost, and the priests who are just helpers of the bishops. It's mainly the bishops who are the apostles. I'll never forget, well, I, I went to help a certain bishop in a certain diocese once upon a time in another galaxy far, far away. <laughs> and the bishop said to me, well, I'm... I, I, you know, I want you to, to do this. I, I've actually brought you here to do my job. And I said, whatever do you mean? He said, well, they've got me so tied up in administration and responding to lawsuits and this and that, that you have to do my fundamental job, and that's teach the faith. That's the job of every bishop, to hand on the doctrine of the faith. We don't send ourselves. We are sent. And it is God who does the sending. And may he grant us the strength to do what we're supposed to do. But the Old Testament is so essential. You cannot understand the New Testament unless you understand where it came from. You've got to understand the Old Testament. What, you know, that little catechesis that, that I mentioned about the book of Genesis, the origins of evil the original sin, creation, the fall. That's fundamental. That's foundational. We get that from the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments. You know, uh, that's Old Testament. The, but a lot of times they'll say, oh, well, that's Old Testament, meaning passé. We have this kind of strange notion in our day of imagining that the only thing any good is what we come up with in our own time. And that everything that went before us is is rather outmoded. That, the rapid advances in technology have a tendency of doing that to us. Now, technology is good, but you know we've had more changes in the last century than in all the rest of time put together? I mean, the advances have be, they've been so rapid. <clears throat> there have been... Uh, well, you can't hardly keep up with it. it they have these things, uh, timelines, that show these um, essential changes in technology that resulted in, like um, the assembly line, you know, when they came up with the assembly line, that rapidly advanced the mechanization of the world. So much has happened. Well, we tend to think <clears throat> that we are the smartest of all. You know, that, that's the egocentric dimension of the human condition. And it's also part of fallen nature. It's called egoism, pride, arrogance, to imagine that we're better than everyone who went before us. We have made great advances in technology. That's good. Medicine, science, that's wonderful. What a blessing from God. But very often in progressing in those 
things, we have regressed in the higher sciences of theology and philosophy very often. And then you have to ask, uh, say, overall, have we progressed or regressed? You know, uh, we can possibly soon clone human beings. We can do all kinds of things. Just because we can do it, should we do it? Not necessarily. And so we're on shaky ground very often. The old lessons are very often the best lessons. God gave us a foundation and a framework in the Old Testament. It's still valid. It's not passed away. Not one word, not one letter of one word will ever pass away, the Lord said. For he comes again in glory. And so this has permanent value. Now let me give you an example of this concept of type and archetype or antitype. It's very, very important. I mentioned the seraph serpents, okay, in the Old Testament. Now you can, you can read that account. The chosen people were wandering in the desert trying to find the promised land. And they had all kinds of tests and afflictions. By the way, that, that wandering in the desert is a spiritual prefigurement, representation of our own life. I feel like I've been wandering in the desert for a long time. You know, I've, I've encountered the heat of the day and the noonday sun, the cold of the night. I've encountered predators, you know, venomous serpents. Those things are all figurative representation of the spiritual battle all of us are going through. We're passing through a vast wasteland of a desert on our way to the promised land of heaven. We have God to guide us. Remember that God appeared as a pillar of fire and he guided the people through the desert. They were hungry. So he performed a miracle. He rained down manna from he heaven, and as the one pseudo-scholar said, it is not ant dung. That the manna in the desert is a biblical type or prefigurement of the Holy Eucharist. They were, they were hungry. They were starving. But man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Manna in the desert fed the people. The Eucharist, the archetype of that biblical Old Testament type of the manna in the desert. The Eucharist feeds us. We're on a journey through the desert seeking the promised land. We're hungry. What happens if you don't eat? Well, you get sick. You get weak. If you don't eat long enough, you die. A lot of people say, why do I have to go to Mass on Sunday? Well, physically, not many of us would be willing to miss a meal. Now, I'll ask you this. Out of seven days in a week, I'll bet you eat more than once. <laughs> Don't you think your soul deserves one good meal a week? What happens if you don't receive the Eucharist? You become weak, morally weak. You can get sick. That's called sin. You can die. That's called hell if you don't repent of it. So, you see, these biblical types teach us. They have hidden meanings. They are consummated. Old Testament, New Testament. Moses striking the rock at Merah. Now, we read in the Old Testament as they're wandering through the desert. Now, I talk about they didn't have food. Well, God, good father. Gave him mana in the desert. That's a prefigurement of the Eucharist. The type, mana. The archetype, the Eucharist. What is prefigured is fulfilled. Old Testament, prefigurement. New Testament, fulfillment of what was prefigured. All right. Now, they don't have any water. Okay, they're dying of thirst. They're in a desert, after all. And so what happens? Well, the usual. They complain. They complained to Moses. The, Moses is a type of Christ. Moses was the mediator, right? The people went to Moses. Moses went to God. Remember that 
Only Moses could go up on the mountain. The people couldn't go up there. They got too close, they died. But Moses could approach. They went to Moses. Moses, the mediator, took it to God. Well, all right, they're dying of thirst. They complain. Why'd you bring us out here? We could have stayed back in Egypt. We'd had plenty to eat, plenty to drink. Instead, you bring us out here to perish of hunger and thirst. They're dying of thirst. So, well, Moses goes to God. They're dying of thirst. <laughs> so God says, all right, take the wooden staff with which you parted the waters of the Red Sea and strike the rock. Now remember, they're at Meribah. Well, Moses took the wooden staff and he struck the rock. What happened? The rock gave forth water. And the chosen people were able to drink that water and it kept them alive in the desert. The desert is an inhospitable place. The desert is a dangerous place. The desert is an easy place to die. That is a biblical prefigurement of Christ, the Redeemer. Jesus is the rock, the chief cornerstone of our faith. When struck by the wood of the cross, he gives forth the life-giving waters of the Holy Spirit, those waters which well up unto eternal life. And so you see the biblical type, the old covenant type, the rock at Meribah, Moses the mediator, prefiguring Christ, the wood of the cross that struck the life-giving waters of the Holy Spirit that keep us alive. He is called the Lord and giver of life. And so you gain deep insight into these spiritual realities. That's a great one. It's a wonderful illustration. The rock is Christ. The rock at Mamba. The wood of the cross. They're dying of thirst. Many people are dying of thirst today, spiritually and morally speaking. Christ is the rock. His passion, death, and resurrection struck by the wood of the cross. The Holy Spirit is poured forth. Remember what happened when he died on the cross and the soldier's lance pierced him? Blood and water flowed out. That water is a symbol of baptism, but also of the Holy Spirit. Christ, the Savior, feeds us and gives us to drink. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will live forever. And so you see the marvelous, mystical, beautiful word of God. One word, Old Testament, New Testament, permanent value, all of it, valuable. All right. Some of the Old Testament women, for instance, another example here. Now, nowadays, we have, unfortunately, and also to a certain extent, understandably, uh, all kinds of people are upset about all kinds of things. Sometimes for good reason, sometimes not for such a good reason, but whatever the case, if somebody's upset, there's a reason why they're upset and it has to be dealt with. A lot of people say, oh, the church is patriarchal, a male-dominated church. Go back to the Old Covenant, they would say, oh, women didn't have any rights, even worse than the Old Covenant. And I understand, I understand why someone could say that. But I would always point out such great figures as Sarah, Ruth, Judith. What often happened when the ordinary means that God uses failed? When they had no priest, prophet, or king in Israel? What happened? Well, God raised up a woman. You're, Judith, a powerful woman. Ruth. These, listen, they, the, this figure of speech, the, the weaker sex, baloney. <laughs> Not in Christianity. Now, in the Old Testament, these womanly figures, Ruth, Judith, Sarah, they can be, if you look at it spiritually, you can see the Blessed Mother or the church or both, prefigured in this. The great 
women of the Old Testament prefigured Mary, the mother of the Lord, interceding for her children, uh, battling with the red dragon in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. You remember, Israel was lost. And it was at one point a woman who cut off the head of the ruler of the enemy army. You know, it was a woman who did that. And it is a woman today put in that place by her son who leads an army. I shall write a book one day and it shall be entitled Your Mama Wears Combat Boots. <laughs> And it'll be all about the Blessed Mother, <laughs> who is the fulfillment and archetype of all those Old Testament strong women. And how many beautiful, magnificent, strong women there have been through history and are right now. You know, all the mothers, unheralded, and yet, Without them, where would any of us be? There's a beautiful oneness involved in the truth, a strength, an integrity. You know, the church is not prejudiced against women. It is true that individuals in the church at times have erred. But it is not the church herself that has ever been prejudiced. It is individuals in the church who have made errors and continue to at times. Uh, you know, I often will say, I think that to be a mother is one of the highest and most noble vocations there is. I will never be one. <laughs> I'm never going to be a mother. Oh, woe is me. Maybe I should get a placard and picket God. Oh, God, you are a bigoted God. You have not allowed me the dignity of the vocation of being a mother to have children and nurture them and raise them and give them to the world and the church. You're unfair. You say, that's ridiculous. Well, some people say, oh, I can never be a priest. Your dignity is corresponding to the grace of of what God gave you. You may never be a priest, and I'll never be a mother. Get over it. <laughs> God, the inspirer and author of both testaments, wisely arranged that the New Testament be hidden in the Old and the old made manifest in the new. For, through, for though Christ established the new covenant in his blood, still the books of the Old Testament, with all their parts caught up into the proclamation of the gospel, acquire and show forth their full meaning in the New Testament, and in turn shed, shed light on it and explain it. That's number 16 from Dave Erbum. That paragraph, number 16, really supports what I said before. The Old Testament. You've got to read it and understand it to truly understand the New Testament and vice versa. It's one word of God, compenetrated, interdependent. My brothers and sisters, it's serious stuff. But it isn't really difficult stuff. If enough of us would take the time, give forth the effort to learn these simple things, and then to put them into practice, this would change lives. This would change families. And that would change societies. And that would change the world. And the world would be a much, much better place. The Word of God, not merely something uh, not merely the object of a bland, dry, academic exercise. The Word of God is Jesus. And that Word has the power 
to transform you into who you are. We are created in the image and likeness of God. The likeness is marred because of sin. The word of God will heal us. Uh, I know of people who are so, they've been so wounded emotionally and morally that they were basket cases in a manner of speaking. And they had no one to help them, no priest, no counselor, no rabbi, no minister. And yet they would pick up a Bible and they would open it at random and they would read and God would speak to them as a father speaks to his child. And that word would reach in and heal broken hearts and then they would go on to heal others, compounds itself. The word of God is rich. Learn all you can about it. Be filled with that word. That word has the power to build you up, to expand your being, to transform you into who you are, the body of Christ, capacitated to go out and heal the sick, to deliver those in the grip of evil. That's what it means to be a Christian. And the way that God has given us to build ourselves up is that word of God. Please, continue to pursue this God who pursues you. Continue to enter into that word, to live that word, to make that word present, and to allow that word to work through you to bring all men and women to Jesus the Lord. We're going to take a lunch break. And then we'll come back and we'll have a lecture on the New Testament and then how Scripture is used in the life of the church. God bless you.